We'd like to welcome back to Breakthrough News, David Sheen. Yes. He's a journalist coming to us from Haifa. Um, David, thank you so much for joining us again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me again. Good to be back. So um, it's under some better circumstances. Now there's been a ceasefire put into place, uh, obviously, with Gaza. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess after this recent explosion of violence, we'd like to hear from you. Maybe let's start off with how mm -hmm. are the Israelis, how's the Israeli press, how are Israeli government officials interpreting what just happened in <clears> terms <throat> of whether it's seen as a victory or not? Uh, and what does it mean mm -hmm. for the future of Israeli politics? Mm -hmm. Well, straight from the start, it seemed extremely obvious to analysts of the situation from close up that it was an excuse for Netanyahu to bury his political problems. And what I mean by that very briefly is, as I've mentioned on the show before, we just finished a fourth election in two years time, one election after the other. And in each time, Netanyahu was not able to put together majority government based on the mandate, the votes that he received. So for, for him, after he failed the fourth time in a row, the president gave the opportunity to put together a government to the next biggest party, the next largest opposition party in Israel's parliament, the Knesset. And just then, when it looked for the first time ever, perhaps, that we would have in Israel a government that included Palestinian citizens of Israel. That's never happened in 73 years for obvious reasons, because Palestinian citizens of Israel, about 20% of the country, are not regarded as legitimate political players. Uh, although ostensibly, you know, they have most of the rights and privileges, definitely not all, but they have the right to vote for the parliament, even though the, you know, the parties that they vote for are never considered legitimate players. They're often called out and just called terrorists and terrorist supporters, and violence is incited against them. So they've never, ever been seen as legitimate players politically. But because after two years, Netanyahu was not able to put together a government, um, his opponents realized that the only way they could, they, they also were not able to put together a government on their own, if they were only going to use Jewish political power to do so. That the only way they could get Netanyahu out of office would be to ally with the Palestinian citizens of Israel and their elected representatives, the joint lists. Now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, to understand correctly, the opposition parties, the other nationalist, secular nationalist parties and religious nationalist parties and so forth, they are no less racist against Palestinian citizens of Israel for the most part, but and we can see that from their, you know, previous, most of these people, keep in mind, most of these opposition leaders were themselves either in Netanyahu's Likud party, his ministers and such, and then broke off to form their own parties, or they were, in the case of, let's say, the leader of the elimination camp, Naftali Bennett, he was Netanyahu's personal advisor, key advisor. So all the these party leaders have worked with Netanyahu. In the case of Yair Lapid, the current opposition leader, he you know, was in Netanyahu's government just a few years ago, supporting the previous assault on Gaza in 2014. He bears responsibility for 500 children killed in that war. Um, and so these pol oppositional politicians aren't any less racist, but after, many, you know, uh, election after election, where they're unable to unseat Netanyahu, they realized, okay, we need to work hand in hand with Palestinian citizens of Israel and their representatives if we are to oust Netanyahu. And this was, you know, not a small thing for Palestinians to be willing to, you know, think of such an arrangement because, as I pointed out, these people are themselves massive racists. Let's say the leader of the opposition just a few minutes ago, Benny Gantz, he's currently Netanyahu's defense minister. A few, you know, in the last election cycle, he was the oppositional candidate and the joint list recommended him for prime minister. They were willing to have him as prime minister and support his candidacy, even though they knew that this is the man who was the chief of staff of the Israeli army in the last Gaza war. Not only was he responsible as the chief of the army for you know, all those civilian deaths and 
all those children's deaths. But when he launched his political career in Israel after the army, it's very common for generals to either move on to become war profiteers selling arms or to go into politics or both. In any case, uh, Gantz, he launched his political career, if you can imagine this, with a commercial that advertised the death toll that had drone footage of Gaza showing the devastation that Israeli forces had wrought and actually the numbers you know, rising, 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 showing the amount of people that had killed. And the number that it, it reached was far greater than the number of militants, Hamas militants that Israel had killed in that war. That number included civilians. He was not embarrassed to boast about killing civilians. And even despite this humiliating, and this is the you know, liberal. You're talking races. about the liberal, right? This is the liberal. Of <laughs> yes. Right? This was the liberal candidate, the quote unquote liberal candidate. The so-called the liberal race. candidate, the, the challenger Netanyahu from the center, so-called. Right. So even though this was how he tried to appeal to Israeli voters by advertising his role in those massacres of 2014, the Palestinian parties were still willing to recommend him because they realized that Netanyahu is even worse. He's intransigent and we can't get him out unless there's some kind, even if it's just a temporary truce with the other nationalist parties. And even then, with that, you know, Gantz spat in his face. So in this, in this round, just before, just before this, uh, you know, 11 days of fighting or two weeks of, you know, chaos, we had the opportunity to exchange. Finally, the Jewish parties realized what the Palestinian parties had realized and that there was no way to oust Netanyahu except for working with the Palestinians. And just when it looked like that might be possible, that's when Netanyahu tanked any possibility of it. Because, of course, whenever there's a war, whenever there's an assault on Gaza, then nationalist sentiment rises rapidly. And so Israeli Jews who perhaps are in the center and could be swayed to either side, maybe would have been open to supporting such an eventuality. Now, mm -hmm. many of them are, you know, have swung far to the far right with all of the rhetoric that they've been receiving, being bombarded with, you know, pro-nationalist discourse. And it has to be said, genocidal discourse, it's rather disgusting to read what Israeli journalists have been saying. I mean, just, not just to say who they've been bringing on television to, you know, former generals to opine on, mm -hmm. you know, how much devastation, how much more devastation should be caused, but actual journalists themselves advocating for it, suggesting what kind of massacre Israel should propagate next in order to advance its military objectives. And um, the, most of these journalists have not faced any even reprimanding for that. Mm. And, and, and of course, they'll, I'm sure, go on to do speaking tours in the United States next time around, you know, to, 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 yeah. to capitalize on their careers. So you know, this is where we're at, the political Gans. moment where we're at. Well, mm -hmm. you mentioned Benny Gantz, and he's like one of the less extreme voices. And even he, as defense minister right now, at one point during this bombardment of Gaza, actually said, Gaza will burn. He used that. He used those words. Um, mm -hmm. Gaza will burn. A Hamas will burn, which would be bad enough, but Gaza will burn. So that's the kind mm -hmm. of rhetoric you see from centrists in the Israeli government. David, I want to ask you, you know, one element of this war, which I think we saw a little bit um, of this in 2014 as well, but not to this extreme degree, was the level of Israeli Jewish extremism in the street, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. All across these cities in Israel, um, particularly mis mixed cities, but as well as other cities as well, there was people, mm -hmm. Israeli Jewish extremists organizing on social media, um, as well as apps, you know, as well as WhatsApp and Signal, organizing lynch mobs to go find mm -hmm. Palestinians to attack. I think, if I'm not mistaken, this has subsided to some degree. But this, there was a huge explosion in this kind of violence. Can you give us an idea of that element of this? What happened over the last two weeks with this explosion of extremism? And where do you mm -hmm. see it going now that this war on Gaza has come to a um, ceasefire? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, first of all, it has to be said that uh, you know the kinds of anti-Palestinian pogroms that we saw last week uh, obviously are, are not new for this country. It's just that those kinds of pogroms, we're used to seeing them in the West Bank, where, where you know, there's complete 
apartheid. Palestinians have no rights whatsoever. And so settlers can act with total impunity and assault Palestinians and walk amongst Israeli soldiers who are patrolling the West Bank and the soldiers who it's ostensibly their job under international law to protect the local population from assaults. Uh, you know, soldiers who are, you know, patrolling do not even make any efforts to stop these settler pogroms. So we've seen this for years going on, but it's far from, far away from the cameras for the most part, and far away from most of Israel's population centers. But now we have those same thugs coming from the settlements in the West Bank into Israel proper, uniting with local racists, and frankly, with groups that they have sent into the city in the last 15 years, funded by the government. They're called Garinim Toraniim. They're small religious seminaries and uh, support networks for them that are consciously established, purposefully established in Israeli cities, which the few cities where there's actually Jews and non-Jews, Jews and Palestinians living side by side, in order to Judaize those cities so that there can be full spectrum Jewish domination. And so that there can't be, uh, you know, the, the coexistence that Israel boasts about in its propaganda efforts, it funds efforts to quash that. Um, so those kind, that kind of pogrom level violence, we saw that last week on the streets of Israel, Tiberias, Haifa, Ramle, Lid, Yaffa, Akka, all around the country, um, north, south. Uh, it, you know, we have groups of Israelis, and sometimes these reach into the hundreds. You know, but certainly dozens marching through the streets, stopping cars, asking people to say a few words: Are you Jewish? Are you not Jewish? If they're Jewish, they're allowed to pass. If they're not Jewish, and they're taken out of their cars and beaten. Wow. Um, we've seen this again and again. And yes, it has died down in somewhat after, you know, it hit the screens and to, to such an all out extent, you know, after a few days of police doing little to stop this pogrom, these anti-Palestinian lynch mobs, finally, you know, some of that has died down. Of course, the way that those events were interpreted for the Israeli population was just the opposite. So instead of it being reported as Palestinians are being attacked in the streets by racists um, who are upset at the fact that they're raising their heads, that they're deeming to speak out and, you know, protest in solidarity with their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem and in other parts of the country. So now they are labeled as enemies and they're ripe for being victims of violence. Um, it's frightening. It's not quite certain how, if that level of violence is, or how soon that level of violence is going to ramp up again. But it's always just there bubbling under the surface. And the fact that it wasn't even explained to Israelis, they weren't even told that that was what was happening. In fact, just the opposite. The way it was interpreted for them by the Israeli media are that these are anti-Jewish pogroms. Now, certainly, mm. once the violence went off, yeah, there were Palestinians who were defending their communities and some who went on the offensive and beat Jewish people up in the streets, including Jews who didn't deserve to be beaten, attacking Jewish property in the street, including Jewish property that didn't deserve to be attacked. But having said that, uh, it was, you know, the, the, the Israeli police commander, uh, who, after several days of this, said, look, I'm trying to quell the violence on both sides. We have to arrest the terrorists on both sides. And once he said that, the police minister actually silenced him and berated him and said, you know, how dare you say such a thing? It was an anti-Jewish pogrom, period. That's what it was. <laughs> Wow. And so this is how it's being interpreted for the Israeli people that even though it's the you know nuclear power with all the power of the state at its disposal and the settlers are attacking without any repercussions and in recent days we've seen 
the vast majority of arrests, 90% of the arrests have been of Palestinian citizens of Israel from those, from, from those violent outbreaks. So certainly there's going to be more. And yeah. who, what's going to set it off? Who can say? But that's where we're at. Now, yeah, there has been some effort in Israeli society. Some corporations have made efforts to say, whoa, okay, this is like all out you know, race riots, we need to do something to stop this because some of our uh, customers are non-Jews. You know, we don't want to lose that right. customer base. So let's put out pro-peace messages. Let's put out coexistence messages. Well, it would have been nice if you had not waited until there were all out pogroms to do so. Um, but the, the problem is that when corporations take steps like this, they're often facing a negative feedback loop that they are that ah you are for <laughs> you do see palestinians as equals and deserving of equal rights ah well then i'm going to withdraw my money from your company i'm i'm going to switch telephone companies so that i don't have to so that i can pay another racist company to to provide me with services so um there has been some pushback but sadly sickeningly i don't see that it's enough and just the opposite the racist sentiments in society have only strengthened in the past week, based on my analysis. Mm. Well, we are continuing to talk to investigative reporter David Sheen. And real quick, shout out to Krista Falakis for your donation, thanking us for this ongoing coverage. We thank you for watching. I, I mean, David, what you're saying is, I mean, I almost don't even know what to say because I... I it, you look at the international, uh, I think for many people around the world, maybe is a better way for me to say it, people were mm -hmm. shocked to see this sort of extremist violence, because especially, I mean, in the United States, as you know, it's sort of the opposite of what's presented about Israel, what, you know, Israel is supposed to be like. And I mean, I guess what I'm curious about in a way, I mean, it seems that I already know the answer from what you're saying, is that rather than sort of this being revealed to the world and some even more mainstream people saying, okay, maybe we have to separate or curtail this, that it's almost like a bunker mentality uh, and, and that presenting a different face to the world has almost become less important because of the internal politics. I don't know if I'm interpreting that right, um, but it just seems, uh, I mean, almost amazing to hear that despite the fact the whole world has seen this, that people are not, I don't know, doing more to put a curtain in front of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I imagine the situation would be a little bit different if English was the language that most Israeli Jews got their news in, but... Mm -hmm the language they get their news in for the most part is Hebrew. There's only one country in the world that produces Hebrew language media, that's Israel. And so they receive, you know, Israeli propaganda or, or the Israeli side of the story or the Israeli nationalist side of the story. And so those, those views are reinforced and they're not on an equal ground where they can read what other people... And in, I, I shouldn't say that. There, there have been some... You know, obviously, we live in the internet era. People can turn on Fox News, Sky News, CNN, NBC, whatever the case may be, but those are automatically framed as anti Semites. And sickeningly, what we've seen, as I alluded to earlier, was this rally around the flag during wartime where even folks who, you know, I've thought of as liberal Zionists who ordinarily are actually quite critical of the government and speak out against it during wartime have labeled you know, the foreign media as anti-Semitic, you know. John mm -hmm. Oliver puts out a really interesting segment calling Israel out for apartheid policies. John Oliver's anti-Semitic, you know. Th this is the automatic knee-jerk response. The only piece of Hasbara that maybe we've seen crumble, or Hasbara meaning Israeli propaganda, the only piece of propaganda that perhaps we've seen crumble is this idea of how dare you call Israel an apartheid state because Israel has Arabs, they won't say Palestinians, but Arab citizens, and they're equal in every way, and they're perfectly happy. And you know, they're, they believe that they are treated well. They feel they're treated well. Now, there's no way really for people to claim that because part of the new uh, narrative is, oh, these Palestinians can't be trusted even inside Israel because look at them mobbing you know, chasing after Jews and attacking Jews only because they're Jews, you know, mm. not, not because they're being attacked and because they're being dispossessed, but only because they're Jews as if, you know, we're in 1930s, 1940s, Nazi Germany. So, um, yeah, this is, this is, this is, what we, this is what we're looking at now, a complete shift 
uh, to the to the right. That's what happens in wartime here. So Israelis, even from their ostensibly liberal commentators, are getting knee jerk nationalist propaganda. I can't imagine how they could possibly develop a different idea without any other option. Mm. You know, David, yeah, I, I mean, remember it speaks so much um, to the universality of apartheid experiences. Really, I mean, you think about the Jim Crow South, South Africa, Zimbabwe. It's uh, they're happy, and the media, of course, is completely compliant, completely disruptive. I mean, it's a, I mean, it's, it's just a powerful parallel to make. Sorry, Rania, I cut you off there. No, 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 no. I just, I was just going to note to what David was saying. And again, to those who are watching, we're speaking with investigative journalist, David Sheen. He's coming to us from Haifa. Um, I remember a couple or maybe a week and a half ago when all of this really started, mm-hmm. the uh, mayor mm-hmm. of, of Lod uh, actually mm-hmm. said that what was happening, he compared it to crystal knot. Um, yeah. which seemed like a huge, like you said, they were, that was how the Israeli mm-hmm. media was covering it was these are pogroms mm-hmm. against Jews when, you know, mm-hmm. uh, while you, you mentioned there was of course, uh, Jewish people who were attacked and, and Jewish homes, mm-hmm. but there's a huge mm-hmm. difference when you have state violence on your side. And mm-hmm. in this case, mm-hmm. obviously Israeli Jews have the state to help them. And to, um, mm-hmm. you know, I remember speaking to one Palestinian woman who was saying how terrified she was because like if you get attacked who are you going to call if the police come they either help the lynch mobs or they just stand by and watch it happen and do nothing um so anyways i i want to ask you though you know when when we talk about israel as like a right-wing country politically you know you mentioned before this kind of divide between um and how netanyahu gained from this war but when we talk about netanyahu and who his alliances are with can you describe to our viewers what that means, because Netanyahu has really made this alliance with, you know, not just the right wing, but the hard right. I mean, there's Kahanists mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. Israeli government now, mm-hmm. and he's allied with mm-hmm. their political parties. So can you describe mm-hmm. what the right wing Israeli political scene looks like and what it means uh, to be this mm-hmm. right wing, what it, what their agenda is? Sure. So. Um... Briefly, let's say that Israeli politics, about 60, 65% of the votes go to the nationalist parties, the secular nationalist parties who want a domination solution, a one apartheid state. And about 20%, let's say, are voting for the eliminationist parties, we'll call them the religious parties that aspire to see one apartheid state from the river to the sea but even more than apartheid, one that's ethnically cleansed of non-Jews. So in the past, the proponents, you know, the the religious parties, they, you know, their ideology or their theology did speak to ethnically cleansing the country, but they always kind of postponed that to a messianic era. They said, you know, it is not for us as ultra-Orthodox Jews to bring that, uh, that era in which we are, you know, all, you know, where there's total dominant, total Jewish domination over all the lands. Um, it's not for us to bring that into being. It's for God to bring into being. Until then, we will follow the rules and regulations of the Torah and the Talmud and, you know, live our religious lives. But uh, especially we see that since the Six Day War in 1967, when Israel captured the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and other territories, that for religious people, this was like an event that made them think that this, it is now the messianic era. And so the layers of theology, uh, not neutral theology, but racist theology that they, that people had piled on over the centuries, you know, that had been dormant and had been, you know, had not been put into practice in any way because Jews were always a minority in every state that they lived in. Now that Israel was a majority and that it was mighty, for many religious people, they started to think that the time is now to put that plan into practice. And we, at that point, see the rise of Israel's messianic camp. And uh, this is this, this a very small camp on the furthest, farthest you know, right wing of Israeli politics. But for the last 50 years, they've dragged the whole the political system to the right, increasingly, increasingly to the far right. And you pointed out the name Kahanist, and we're talking about the disciples of the arch-racist American Israeli rabbi, Mayor Kahana. 
And he broke the taboo that had existed up until that point in Israeli society, where, of course, the establishment of the state of Israel depended upon ethnically cleansing the country of Palest indigenous Palestinians and not allowing them to return after the war to ensure that the, there was an artificial democratic majority, a Jewish democratic majority. Um, but now, you know, if those ethnic cleansings had occurred in the past and okay, now that we've established our Jewish majority, we can let sleeping dogs lie. No, the Kahanas said we need to, to continue doing so. We need to continue ethnic cleansings. And he would call for ethnic cleansings. And he was eventually elected to the Israeli parliament. And at that point, he had a platform which to, to you know, advance his agenda. Now, to give you a sense of what's changed since that in the, in, in the last few decades, you know, when Kahana was first elected in the 1980s, his views, his outright racism, unabashedly calling for ethnic cleansing without shame was considered scandalous. And so even most right-wing Israeli uh, politicians uh, you know, withdrew from him and they didn't want anything to do with him and they considered his brand toxic. But what's happened over, the, and in fact, they voted uh, the, the parliament and the judiciary both you know, expelled him from political office, said his party is racist and can't run in elections anymore. Okay, that's 1988. Here we are 33 years later, and in recent years, Netanyahu has actually brought the descendants of Kahana, the ideological descendants, his supporters, those who have, you know, been part of his organization for the last 50 years. He's brought them into the parliament, made them his deputies, made, you know, made them valuable uh, members of his inner clique. The leader of the Jewish power party, of the Kahanist party, Itamar Ben-Gvir, has been working in lockstep with Benjamin Netanyahu. It took a couple of years to actually bring him to that point, but now he's in the Israeli parliament. And now he has parliamentary immunity, which he can use to incite further you know, calls to ethnic cleansing. And in fact, what we see in the Israeli media, if we look in the last week, we see that the number one Israeli, the politician that has received the most airtime on Israeli TV is Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister. The second most airtime has been given to Itamar Ben-Gvir, the head of the Kahanist party, who, you know, organizes these death to the Arabs, you know, rallies that we see on the streets of Jerusalem and in cities across the country. You know, for years, he's, him and his, you know, and, and his Kahanist fellows have been organizing lynch mobs under the aegis of what's called the anti-miscegenation group called Lehava, a group that uh, patrols Israeli cities uh, looking for mixed couples, looking for Jews and non-Jews, speaking to one another and then harassing them and haranguing them, assaulting the non-Jews, trying to drive them out of the city so that there'll be complete separation. So we're talking about a group that on its own is responsible for the murder of 50 plus Palestinians in Palestine in the last 50 years. And they're a political movement. And they've now been koshered. Now, what's interesting is that the American Jewish establishment has said nothing about this. You know, Netanyahu first started trying to openly bring them into parliament two years ago. He finally did it a couple months ago. And since then, we've heard crickets. So once the whole world, you know, support, we have the Canadian government, the American government, the German government, governments around the world supporting Israel's assaults, that's supporting the Netanyahu Kahana government. You know, we're talking about a party that openly calls to ethnic cleansing, part of Netanyahu's, you know, entourage. And even though that's what's driving Israel's war machine, the world, whether it's Jewish organizations in other parts of the world, mainstream Jewish establishment Jewish organizations, unelected groups, but say that they speak for Jewish residents, Jewish citizens of other countries, and the, 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 the actual governments of said countries that are supposed to represent all the population, not only the Jewish population of those countries, saying they support Israel's war. And, and 
not criticizing the fact that the Netanyahu government, the Netanyahu government is a Kahanist government. It's hard to say anymore that even the Jewish establishment in the U.S. is not Kahanist if they don't say anything to speak out against. And we saw that even the so-called liberal leaders of the reform movement of Judaism, you know, the supposedly liberal stream of Judaism, appealing to young American Jews and saying, you know, you need to stand up for Israel now and you need to propagandize for Israel now. Now that the Kahanists are in the driver's seat of Israel's war machine, you want American Jews to propagandize for them, for the Kahanist war machine? It's really reached uh, ridiculous levels of psych psychophancy, but this is where we are. If I could just add one more no. little, little piece that might give you a perspective. So about four years ago, Israel's comptroller, comptroller is a, a, a government position, a political position, who's supposed to you know, analyze the works of the government and, and issue reports and recommendations, how it could be more professional, more efficient. So you know, he analyzed Israel's education ministry and he looked at it and he issued a report saying, instead of educating for anti-racism, Israel is doing nothing of the sort. It's making no effort. In fact, it's, it's purposeful. It's not just uh, by you know, by default, not doing anything. It's actively not doing anything to try to prevent outbreaks of racism. It's not educating its citizens uh, to coexistence. Now, since, you know, as Netanyahu's corruption crimes have reached the indictment level and he's realized that he's one step away from a jail cell, all of the, you know, the Israeli government has become even more corrupt and the people that he's appointed to various positions are, you know, they aren't even professionals anymore. They're, they're obviously political appointees. So the new comptroller is himself, a, you know, was put in that position specifically because he was friendly to Netanyahu and, ha and won't criticize him. And even this Netanyahu, you know, someone that Netanyahu has in his pocket, the new comptroller, he just issued just uh, this week another report years later mm. saying, looking at Israel's education ministry and its education and, uh, you know, it's, it's a curriculum. And again, saying, again, Israel is doing nothing to stymie the insane levels of hatred that are coursing through society. Instead of educating the youth towards coexistence, it's doing nothing to stop the, the rampant racism mm. in Israeli society. So. Is it any wonder that children grow up, pipe, it's like cradle to army pipeline, and right. the propaganda that they receive from the Hebrew media tells them that they're a traitor if they speak out for coexistence, if they believe that everyone's equal, if they oppose the wars that are fought in mm -hmm. their name. And mm -hmm. so for a young person coming up here, they're almost you know brainwashed into it. I, I, of course, people yeah. have a responsibility for their actions but it, this is what the country is churning out sure no yeah, i think that's that's really important 360 yeah. degrees of, of hate well uh, investigative journalist david sheen really appreciate you giving us more of your time here on breakthrough news thanks for joining us today thanks for having me take care